He's actually doing better this time than he did last time. Pain, pain is still pain, and nothing hurts like pain. And uh, he's so he's he, but he is staying on top of his meds to be able to keep that uh, keep that under control. But because he's doing better than he was uh, last time, he's pushing himself more, and so now he's he's just tired. I mean, he is. He is just worn out is a, probably the best way to put it. But we came to the clu- conclusion it's because he's doing more than what he did before. He's Right now, I would say he's probably where last, uh, uh, last time, he's probably uh, at about a week and a half stage already as far as mobility and things that he's doing and a couple things that we probably shouldn't have done today that only he and I know about. Turn your Bible to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, wasn't really sure what to, uh, what to do this evening, but there's been a theme that has popped up several times uh, since Sunday. And uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, the things that are going on in the world. We're, those of us that are saved... Uh, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Well, one of the, what we're going to talk about tonight is how do we deal with stuff from the world? And uh, my example of what I'm going to use here tonight is, uh, is Elijah. Uh, very, you're not going to hear anything, anything new. A lot of it's going to be familiar and review, so I'm not going to read necessarily all, all of the verses, but let's start in 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So what has taken place is they've had the big, uh, they've had the big meeting. Uh, go call all your prophets. We're all going to meet up on the top of Mount uh, Carmel, and uh, you get your sacrifice ready, and you call out to your gods. You got till noon to get them to show up. Whoever brings fire down from heaven, that God will be God. And of course, it doesn't work out for them. And he mocks them and he tells them, you know, maybe if you call a little bit louder, maybe he's sleeping, maybe he's on a journey or something. But uh, nothing, nothing happens as far as fire falling down from heaven. So then he sets up an altar. He, he puts up his sacrifice, has several barrels of water brought up and poured on it. And then the fire from heaven comes down. And then right after that, he says, okay, I want you to get uh, all the prophets of Baal together. And he ends up, ends up slaughtering them. And so that's what, that's what is, is taking place here. Ahab has gone back to tell his wife, all of your prophets are dead. And this is the guy that did it. Verse 3. And when, uh, let me go back and do verse 2 again. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to, unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, And here we go. And requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Uh, The the theme that I'm going to talk about tonight is how discouragement is so easy to get caught up into. And discouragement left for any length of time brings us to a place of depression. And uh, let's see how, let's back up and just, who is, who is this Elijah, this guy that, that called fire down from heaven and, and what was the whole situation? What's the story with Ahab and Jezebel? Turn back to uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, and we'll do a, we'll do a running Bible reading commentary on, on who all our three characters are here. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 16 and, and uh, chapter 16, verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. 
wickedest king that they ever had. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So that's the setting. That's, that's who's in charge of uh, the nation at this point. We drop down to verse 17, and Elisha shows up on the, on the, uh, in the story. And Elisha the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilgal, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth by whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. There's nothing that tells us about Elisha before that. He just shows up on the scene. He, there's no backstory. There's no, there's no, he grew up on a farm. There's no how old he is. We really know nothing about him other than he just shows up. So whether he was traveling before that, the Bible doesn't say. Whether he was recognized as a prophet and, a, uh, and uh, uh, on behalf of God, the Bible doesn't say. The first time we meet him, he's got his bony finger, uh, reading into it, he's got his bony finger into the king's face and saying, judgment's about to fall. I, I, I just find that rather odd that that's the confrontation that takes place. Uh, there's, uh, there's not going to be any rain or dew these years, but according to my word, look over at uh, uh, chapter 18 and verses 1 and 2. So t some time passes, and uh, needless to say that uh, he takes off. Uh, he's, Elijah's fed by the, uh, down by the uh, rivers, down by the riverside, by, uh, by a bunch of, I'll call them crows or ravens or whatever. The, the birds, uh, I'll sidetrack myself here. You ever thought about this story? He's, he's, hiding, he's not hiding out, but he is kind of hiding out for, uh, for about three years. And the birds, the ravens show up and they feed him a couple of times a day. Do you know what ravens eat? Do you know what ravens go after? Dead stuff. Well, I really prefer my cow to be dead before I put it on the grill. But they're not hauling steaks. They're not hauling hamburgers. They're probably hauling, who knows, rabbits. I don't know. The Bible does mention possums. I, I've never had a possum. My, my grandpa used to, he said, it tastes kind of like pork. Yeah, just like everything else tastes like chicken. Uh, but anyway, I just... Well, what do I get to eat today? Anyway, just, hmm. Doesn't even say if he had salt and pepper or any kind of seasoning or anything like that. But uh, so he's, he's, the Ahab is looking for him, trying to hunt him down. So he's staying well, uh, well hidden. He helps take care of, the, uh, of a widow lady and, uh, and her son. And then we, uh, we pick up the story again, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 1. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, go, sh go show thyself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. God says, I will send rain. He doesn't say, you're going to have to do anything. He just says, I will send the rain. You told him it wasn't going to rain, no do. So, and Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in the land. So this time, now when he shows up, all of the problems, all of the lack of water, which has caused the famine in the land, is his fault. Now God did it, but if we look at this from a worldly perspective, everybody's blame, blaming him for it, especially Ahab and and uh, Jezebel. So he just shows up kind of out of the blue and, and uh, gives them, lets them know, okay, we're, we're going to have a, have a further discussion here. Look over here, verse 17. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and now hast followed Balaam. As things have happened in the United States, and I'll just back up to 9-11, which is hard to believe that that's been, what, 20 years? Just hard to phantom that it's been that long ago. There was a short window of time where there was a call back 
to patriotism. There was a call back to godliness, but it was just a short window of time. Everything that has happened since then, it's always somebody else's fault. But it, it ends up lying at the feet of, we're going to blame somebody. It's not my fault. It's not my fault that the economy is doing this. Uh, it's not my fault that the, there's not food on the shelves. It's not my fault that, and fill in the blank, that there's not parts for your uh, automobile when it gets called in for the, uh, for the repair that needs to be done. It's not my fault. It's always somebody else's fault. Young people learn something right away. When it's your fault, own up to it. Just say, I was wrong, or I did it, or it was my responsibility. Just do your job. One of the things that, uh, that I am assuming has taken place here in New York also, like we've had out in Wisconsin, and that's that people cannot find, employers cannot find good employees because people will get hired and they'll show up for about two days and then they quit. Just do your job. If you want to be successful, just do your job. Be, show yourself responsible. Uh, I forgot where I left our reading. What verse are we on before I went into my 18? And he answered and said, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and now hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather to me uh, unto all Israel, unto Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal, 450, and the prophets of the groves, 400, each, uh, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto the uh, all the children of Israel, and they gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. I'm not saying anything. The king's here. Things are not going well. I can just tell by the look on his face. Uh, I can tell with his attitude. Uh, I, I saw a thing on a, a, a poll that a uh, pastor and I were watching uh, Fox News. They're, they're thinking that there's a large block of voters that are not saying anything. If, you know, people are, people are getting polled. And this is what the Republicans are going to do. And this is what the, uh, this is what the Democrats are going to do. And this is who's going to win and everything. They're thinking there's a lot of people that aren't saying anything. And I'm one of them. I would love to put up a Make America Great again. But I'm not. <laughs> not in our neighbor. Our neighbor across the street, they are very conservative. Uh, there's a, a, another one around the corner that's very conservative, but pretty much everybody around us is not that way. And why should I cause more trouble for myself than is necessary? So I'm just going to go quietly vote. Anyway, uh, if God be God, follow him. If Baal be, uh, then follow him. But, and the people answered not a word. We're, ju we're just here observing. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. He makes a false statement. He is not the only one. If, if we took time and look back earlier into, uh, uh, look at chapter 18 here in verse 4. And it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. So there's a hundred that we know of. There was much more which show up a little bit later, which we may get to, may get to that. Look over here at verse 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood. And if he would have just stopped there, it would have been a marvelous thing to see. But I, I smile every time this, I read this. And the stones. Anybody ever burned up a stone? We have had a lot of campfires. We've had a lot of big fires. Uh, Jeremy and who, who is it? Jeremy and Jason burned down the, burned down the shed in the, out there at Breezy Acres. And I uh, almost burned down the big tree. The fire department showed up and everything like that. But nobody burned up a stone. Anyway, I just... I just and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell down on their faces 
And, and they said, The Lord, He is God, for the Lord, He is God. And Elijah said unto, the, unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, and let not one of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the book, brook Kishon, and slew them. And Elijah said unto him, Get thee up, and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So this has been a very time-pressing, a very... He's been put in the public eye. It's, it's, the Lord told him to do it, but it's the responsibility when you become the leader of fill in the blank. At work, uh, you become the leader. It's your turn to preach at the pulpit. Uh, you become the one that's in charge of uh, doing the children's program or whatever. Uh, you not only have to step up, but there's a responsibility that goes up, but all eyes end up being on you. Okay, What's going to happen? Uh, uh, you have been called by God to do this particular responsibility. So all eyes are on him. So it was, I'm sure that he had great faith at this point because he's obeying the Lord. But he already back, already back here in a few, few verses said, even I'm the only one. I'm the only one still standing for the Lord. There's nobody else standing for the Lord at this point. And so he's gone through this whole process, and God shows up in a great and mighty way. Verse 42, so Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elisha went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down on the ground and put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go up now and look toward the sea. And he went up and he looked and said, there's nothing. And he said, go again seven times. So now not only has he been in the, in the public eye, prays, God sends fire down, consumes everything. They go down and they slew or killed all these prophets. And I kind of get the impression from the way that's written in there that he was probably the one that did it. It wasn't the people. There may have been others that joined him. So that's a pretty physical thing. Uh, we won't go into a whole lot of detail, but if you got 450 plus uh, another 400, I mean that's that's a lot of that's a lot of business to take care of. And I'm assuming they had a he probably had a pretty strong and healthy sword, so a lot of physical this that goes with that. Now he has to go pray. Okay, Lord, well this was taken care of. They were taken care of. The people have seen that it's you. Now it's just me and you. I, I said, okay, you need to show up again. Well, he prays and nothing happens. You ever had that happen in your life? Where you've had something that, that you knew this is right. This is, I'm not asking out of, I'm not asking uh, for just for my own benefit, I, I, I believe this is the will of God, and you pray and it seems like nothing happens. Well, the king and the queen, he said it was going to rain. He sent, he sent the king back to go, go see Jezebel. Better go get something to eat and drink because uh, it, don't get caught in the rainstorm. The people, I'm assuming, are going back to their house, assuming that it's going to rain. And so he prays and Nothing happens. He sends his servant seven times. I picture this a, a real a prayer of travail. Uh, almost comparison in my mind as when Jesus was in the garden and said, and he sweat as it were great drops of blood. I mean, if everybody is expecting your prayer to do something very visible, I'm thinking that the pressure is really on. And to, to pray, I mean, did his faith begin to waver? Did it begin to falter? Does our faith, faith begin to falter when we pray about something and pray about something and pray about something and pray about something and it doesn't come about? Mine does. Lord, the Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. Little side note on, on that. Last time we were... I remember it was last time or when we were here in January. Cheryl's been praying for her brother Chuck for how many years now? 40. 40 years. He finally got saved this this summer to the place where he had a very 
Didn't have Bible terminology because he just because he just got saved, but had a very clear witness and testimony. Don't quit praying when God doesn't answer right away. Just 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 keep just keep praying. So here he's been through all this travail, but he he prays. Now the Bible doesn't tell us whether he prayed for five minutes, whether he threw up a short prayer. I'm thinking each prayer got a little bit longer. I know that mine would have, and. Uh, and so he says, uh, okay, go, go up and check. So the servant goes up there and looks and says, nothing. Okay, well, let me go to prayer again. Seven times. <clears throat> Verse 44, and it came to pass at the seventh time, he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, go up and say unto Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get, the, uh, get thee down that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain and Ahab rode and went to Jezebel and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So now has he not only labored, not only has he had a big day, had to build an altar, had to t- kill a sacrifice, uh, prayed down the fire from heaven, uh, slaughtered all these guys over here, goes over here, has to travail in prayer several times before God sends, the, I see a, a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Have you ever thought about that? Okay, was that a man's hand from here, from here, or was it the man's hand uh, clear back where uh, where Mike is sitting? I mean, how big is uh, how big was that cloud the size of a man's hand? Well, it depends, depends upon where you are standing as to how big that cloud is going to be. But okay, we see a cloud. Everybody head for cover because it's about to rain, and then the the uh, the great rainstorm shows up, which brings us back right up to where we were after prevailing in prayer. He runs and he ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. 20 miles. He ran for 20 miles. I'd say he's had a pretty busy big day with all this taking place. And then, verse 1 of chapter 19, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all that he had slain, all the prophets of, with the sword. And Jezebel sent the messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life to, as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey. So he continues on. His day has not finished. A day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree and requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Here's a man that has just seen and done some unusual things. But it's sometimes when we physically get worn down, the flesh begins to control our spirit. And I think that's what happened here. He, he knows what just took place. He knows what, what God has done uh, in a miraculous way several times. But he says, just take my life. I, 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 just, I just can't go on. It wasn't like, okay, Lord, I'm done for the day. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to take a nap. You, you need something else? Talk to me. No. He said, I'm, just take my life. I am done I'm finished. I quit. I'm not going any further. I'm not going on. Just, just take my life. Uh, part of this came about because I was talking to our salt and light people about discouragement and, and everything. And I had read an article about, uh, about people that, that they just get so distraught, so discouraged that they go into a depression. And so I asked, and I, I've, I've got about 22 people that are sitting in there that are between 60 and 80. And I said, how many in here you have been, not just distressed, but you've been seriously depressed? And I was shocked. 
over half of them raised their hand. Now, I was not surprised in that several of the ladies raised their hand because uh, our family has gone through a lot of times when a, when a mom goes, has, gives birth, she'll go through what they call postpartum depression. So it, it's very common. That will last anywhere from a, a few weeks to a year or longer, depending upon uh, the woman's body and, and who it is and everything. Uh, so I was not surprised, about, but I was surprised that over half of the men that raised their hand and said, yeah, I, I've had... I, there's a, been a time or two where I've de- dealt with severe depression. So I said, well, do you want me to do a, do a lesson on it? And of course, that was a mistake asking that. So I ended up reading four books. Uh, I, I ended up with, uh, I think I have 27 pages of notes. And uh, here's some of the conclusion that, uh, that I came, uh, came to. Depression is, has been called the common cold of mental disorders. And uh, one source estimates that it it disrupts the lives of 30 to 40 million Americans. So what they're saying is one out of every 10 people will say, oh yeah, I'm depressed. Not, I've been depressed, will say, I am depressed. I'm uh, I'm really having a struggle here. Depression is too complicated to to solve with a single pat answer. Gary Collins, who wrote in a Christian counseling magazine, lists seven major categories for depression and six major approaches to treating depression. In addition, people use the word, and here's a key, people use the word depression to cover everything from a disappointment of losing a baseball game to the terrifying gloom that drives people to suicide. We've had a couple of suicides in our area recently, but how many times have you just heard somebody say randomly, you know, I, I'm, I'm depressed, I, we lost. Well, I can't say the Bills lost. The Bills haven't lost yet. <laughs> but, you know, my team lost. I'm, I'm just really depressed. The Bible does not use the word depression, although it describes people whom we would call depressed, and it certainly doesn't mention antidepressant drugs. Listen to me, adults. Depression is a complex area, and severe problems of the depression deserve the attention of a pastor or a counselor. Don't just let it go. There's a, any of you old timers remembered the Bob Newhart show? He said he he was a he was a counselor, and he'd have people come in and he'd deal with them. Well. There's a little skit that I had thought about showing, but we're not set up for it. So this lady comes in and she says, you know, he says, well, how can I help you? She says, I'm I'm depressed. I've been really depressed. I've been depressed for a long time. And he says, I can help you, but he says, "Uh, it'll only take take a couple minutes, but it's going to cost you $100. And she said, well, I am really depressed, but $100 for just a couple minutes, that's a lot of money. But if you can help me, what, what is it? that I'm supposed to do, and he said, stop it! Just stop it! <laughs> well, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> you know, so we, we're, we're watching this on our computer, and he comes in and he says, okay, th- this is the word. Just stop it! So we're laughing about this, and one of Cheryl's friends is, is a now a retired nurse, comes over, and uh, we're sitting around the table, all of us guys are sitting around the table, just watching this video over and over again. And she comes in, and so I, I call Carol over and says, watch this. Well, she didn't think it was funny because just uh, a couple of years before that, her son had committed suicide. Timing has a lot to do <laughs> with sometimes things that are funny and things are not funny. But stop it is not the answer. If you know somebody or you are fighting uh, really fighting long-term discouragement, it will lead to depression. And if you are going through depression, go see somebody. Get a hold of pastor or have him uh, direct you to somebody. Do not just let that thing go because the longer it goes, the harder it is to be able to deal with the situation, to be able to get the help that you need to be able to get out of that. There are many examples of Bible characters who struggle with depression, so to say that depression is not real or that it is always sin is not true. Depression can become sin only when we do not yield to his control and power. 
Also, there are areas which we have no control over, such as actions of other people, but we need to surrender our reactions to those kind of situations. So, uh, what happened to the clock? Oh, it's up on the wall. <laughs> okay, it was, it, was on the, it was on the counter, whatever you call that back there. Here are eight people who struggled with various types of discouragement that can lead to depression. There are also, there, so there's types of discouragement that lead to depression. There's levels of depression, and there's a length of time that can vary from short to a long period. Genesis chapter 15, Abraham. I had never, you know how you're just reading, through, I, I enjoy reading the Old Testament because a lot of it is just commentary. It's kind of like reading, and this doesn't sound good, it's kind of like reading a storybook, but it's real. You know, it's like, I guess it would be better to say it's like reading history. And uh, I enjoy that kind of reading, whereas you get, into, uh, you get into some of the books of the Bible and you really have to put your thinking cap on to figure out what, uh, what God is wanting and what he's talking about. But uh, we pick up here uh, Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verses, uh, beginning in verse 2. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of the house is this... Uh, uh, is this Eliezer of Damascus? And the steward of my house, is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house uh, is mine heir. Uh, why was that a big deal? Why is he discouraged about this? One, he's getting older, and two, everybody was wanting to have, uh, there's already been the promise of a Savior coming. So every Jewish woman wanted to have children. Every Jewish man wanted to have a large family that they might possibly be part of that. But they're also building the nation of Israel. But he's gotten up there in age and he, the, nobody showed up yet. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said to them, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Okay, I believe you, but I'm not getting any younger and neither is my wife. Look over here at chapter 16, verse 16. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So he's had a seed and a son born, but it didn't come through, uh, it didn't come through Sarah at that time. Verse uh, 1 of chapter 17. When Abraham was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Lord God, uh, walk before me and be thou perfect. Okay, you're 86 and you haven't had, uh, you're not having kids yet. And I do believe my wife was supposed to be involved with this, but she gave me this other lady and everything. But uh, now I'm 99 and Lord, this, you, you, you told me just, you told me back here just a chapter <laughs> that uh, we're supposed to, we're going to have, we're going to have seed from our own, from our own flesh. Uh, 17, 17, 1, we read that. Uh, verse 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, the wife, thou shalt not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be mother of a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. you got to be kidding. I'm 99. Yeah. Stick to the notes. <laughs> <clears throat> then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born of him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. He said, You know, appreciate the thought, Lord. Appreciate the word. But... Uh, Let's go with Ishmael. Let's do second best. So there was a time of discouragement that lasted for a hundred years with Abraham, 90 years for Sarah in wanting to have a child. Do you think there was times of depression in the tent sitting around? Man, 
I was pretty sure. I, it was pretty clear to me that we were going to have children. As the sand of the sea and all that, uh, Rebecca turned to Genesis chapter 26. Rebecca goes through a great time of discouragement and depression. <clears throat> Genesis 26. Uh, let me see. Genesis 26, verse 34. So, and Esau was uh, 40 years old when he took a wife, Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashemeth, uh, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, which was a grief of mine unto Isaac and Rebekah. Okay. Abraham and Sarah had finally had a son of their own flesh. Well, that son finally has children, but then they, he starts marrying wrong and was a, of grief of mind to Rebekah. Look over at 27, verse 46. 27, verse 46. And Rebekah said to Isaac, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. If Jacob take a wife of the daughters of Heth, such as these which are the daughters of the land, what good shall my life do me? So they finally end up with a couple of sons, but then, man, they're making bad choices. And, well, one's already messed up. So we got Jacob. We can, we can send Jacob away. Rebecca never sees Jacob again. They send him off to go see, uh, go see his uncle, but she never sees him again and really gets the end of the, uh, end of the story. But there... I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Heth. I've got a couple of ladies that uh, Cheryl and I have gotten to know that we've spent some time with. And it's sad to hear that children do not see their parents. We've got one lady that very seldom gets a chance to see her grandkids and they live not that far away. I am amazed and shocked. And I guess it's because we have such a close family that any kind of a holiday comes around, we're, we're, look, we're having some kind of a family get-together. I mean, it, I don't care. It, it's not just 4th of July. It's Memorial Day. Uh, if we can come up with somebody having a birthday, we're going to get together as a family. And so God has blessed us. And not only have our children, not only did God give us good children, and Cheryl, was, Cheryl and God did an excellent job in raising them, but they, they, married, they married good. They married right. God has blessed us. I mean, we weren't saved when we started having kids, and God has blessed us. Abundantly, but when I hear stories of, well, if my sister's coming to Christmas, you can just write it down, we will not be there. That's heartbreaking, just absolutely heartbreaking that those stories are people that we, you probably even know some yourself. Moses goes through a great time of discouragement and depression. Turn over to uh, Exodus chapter 32. Genesis, Exodus, chapter 32. Exodus 32, beginning in verse 31. And Moses returned unto the Lord. This is after they've um, uh, made the uh, golden calf, and he's come down the mountain with the, with the Ten Commandments. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin, and have made them gods of gold. Yet now... If thou wilt forgive their sin, and there's that pause, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the, thy book which thou hast written. Lord, I'd, I'd, rather, I'd rather die and you spare them than to not see them forgiven of their sin. And he, he ends up, he ends up come, going to the Lord a couple of times and saying, This people that you've given me charge of are just driving me crazy. King Saul. This is an interesting. 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I don't have a lot of comment that I'm going to make about this one. I'm still kind of wading through it. 1 Samuel chapter 16, <clears throat> beginning in verse 14. 
But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command the, uh, thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when, e when the evil spirit is from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him uh, to me. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have, uh, as, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse the Bethlehemite that is a cunning play, uh, that is cunning and playing and mighty valiant man, a man of war, prudent matters, comely person, and the Lord is with him. Uh, so when, when David plays, the evil spirit leaves, verse 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. That is one of the, that is one of the cures or one of the ways of dealing with depression, which we will get into uh, next week, and that's to have good music to be able to listen to and, and to play. Uh, Psalm 6, Psalm chapter 6. David, good night. His, David was up and down and up and down on some of his stuff. There are 47 psalms, not all of them written by, uh, not all of them written by David. 47 psalms that, that deal with uh, uh, discouragement and depression. There's only 150 psalms. One third of all the psalms deal with depression and discouragement. Uh, Psalm 6, beginning in verse... Uh, helps if I'm in Psalms and not Job. Psalm 6, beginning in verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. That's verse five, or chapter 5. Verse, chapter 6, verse 3. My soul is... Also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. And in the grave, who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning all the night. Make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with my tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. Look over at Psalm 38. I just picked two, Psalm 38, also in beginning in verse 3. Psalm 38, verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of what? Because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over my head as a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foulness. I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day, all the day long. Uh, sin can cause depression. As I mentioned at, at the beginning, depression is not always sinful. It's not because you've got sin in your life. It, it, it could be a chemical imbalance. It could be a multitude of different things. But sin can cause depression. Uh, John the Baptist, look at Luke chapter 7. John the Baptist had a great time of discouragement. I don't know as it went all the way to depression, but a great time of discouragement. Luke chapter 7, <clears throat> beginning in verse 19. And John calling, he's in prison. John calling unto him, two of his disciples sent them to Jesus saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And when the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist hath sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he, or should we look for another? And then the same hour he cured uh, many infirmities and evil spirits and everything like that. Uh, almost always, depression begins to lead to doubt. Does it, does it even make any difference if I go to church? One of the worst things that you can do, or anybody can do, is you start getting... You start getting discouraged and it, it builds and it builds and you get depressed. Do not lay out of church. Do not stop reading your Bible. One third of the, one -third of the Psalms may have depression, discouragement in it, but read the Psalms. 
Uh, David will talk about how distressed, how discouraged, how distraught he is, how bad things are going. But he almost always ends on a high note of saying how good God really is. I mean, if you're going through down, a really down time, spend some time reading the Psalms. Stay in your Bible and don't skip church for two reasons. One, you never know what God's going to lead pastor to, to preach about or to talk about that might be the one message you need. You ever sat in church and said, where is so-and-so? They needed to hear this message. Now, I do listen for myself, but sometimes I listen for other people also. But has that ever happened to you? Well, I, I, wish, I wish Cheryl was here to hear this. <laughs> but it, it may be the one thing that will help you to, to, to see the light start breaking through the darkness that you're, that you're living in that's going to give you the, the victory. Plus... It's the fellowship of other believers. And that's another key that we will look at next week. Uh, is don't cut yourself off from people. I don't want to see anybody. I know. On a good day, I usually don't want to see anybody, much less when I'm, when I'm depressed. But that's one of the things that will help us because it gets us out of ourselves or it'll give us somebody to talk to. Or just, there's fellowship. There's something about the fellowship of other believers I mean, even God did not leave Adam for any great length of time, as far as we can tell, in the garden all by himself with a bunch of animals. That would have driven me crazy. Uh, I mean, eventually, uh, along, came, along came Eve. Now, troubles showed up with that, but, I mean, one of the best... One, Justin and Sarah have not been that married that long, and one of the things that I told both of them after they got engaged, I said... It'll be the second best decision you ever made. I mean, Cheryl and I have been together for 51 years. 51 years. <laughs> and right now, for the last 20, it's been just the two of us. We had to learn how to carry on. A, I had to learn how to carry on a conversation again. But it's just the two of us. We're having, we're having the time of our life. And I... I don't want to go on vacation by myself. I don't even like to travel to meetings by myself because I hate sitting in a restaurant, just me and some other old guy that's got nobody else to talk to for whatever reason. <laughs> so if I catch myself in a situation like that, I'll do the drive through or I'll go inside, go to the bathroom, wash my hands, or get my order, and I'll get in the car and drive down the road. I... I, I don't want to be with people, but I want to be with somebody. If you understand, don't cut yourself off from the fellowship of believers in the church. Martha turned to John chapter 11. Mary and Martha went through a great time of discouragement. And I'm thinking left for any length of time would have been depressed if they weren't depressed. Uh, John chapter 11 and uh, verse 21, Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Verse 32, Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Verse 35, Jesus wept. Why was he weeping? He saw the distress and discouragement of two of his closest friends and the one that had died. Yet he, I mean, he knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. I'm, I'm assuming before he even got there, uh, just because of a statement that, that he made earlier, but it, it, fortunately, other than our parents, we've not had to go through the loss of a spouse or a child. I just, I can't imagine the struggle when you realize. I remember my mom saying, it was, it was over a year after my dad had passed, and uh, I was down visiting my mom, and we were talking about different things, and she, I said, well, how are you doing? You know, it's been over a year now. And she said, 
Larry, it, it, it's, it's still a struggle. She says, I'll be watching something on television. I'll, I'll be reading something, and I'll chuckle about it, and I'll go to turn to Dad. And he's not there. After, uh, after both of our dads had passed, I, I was telling the show, I said, our moms have not been on vacation in years. We need to take, <laughs> we need to take the mother-in-laws on vacation with us. And we had several people say, you did what? It was one of the best times. Our kids absolutely loved it. They sat around, they played games, they did all kinds of stuff. The kids absolutely loved it. The mother-in-laws even got along, uh, which was even better. And, uh, but I also realized about that time, my mom had not, never had a hug since dad passed away. Other than, if because at that time, my sister was living in Florida. So I, I started making it a point of giving my mom a hug when I got there and when I left to say, I love you. I can't imagine what it's like to lose a spouse or a child. I'd say a child is worse, but it, it, whenever you lose somebody that's, that's that close, no wonder they were distraught and discouraged and probably going heading into depression 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll uh, wind it up with this, with Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. See, it didn't do any good to have that clock back there anyway. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He was despondent. He was discouraged. He was depressed. He was distraught. He was in despair, even of life. I don't know as he was necessarily saying that he was, Lord, just, just take me home. We, we'll look at that uh, next week over in Philippians. He does basically say that. To be with the Lord is far better than to be left behind, but I'm going to stay with you if it's still needful. But uh, the answer to depression and despair is to die to self and let God work out things in his timing, which takes us back to uh, Elijah. Well, let's lean, turn to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Conclude here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. By now, pastor's been sleeping in the chair for a half hour. <laughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, covetous boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of that, uh, the despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. We don't even have that. All right, would you say that we are in the last days if we just read this list, and we're not gone yet? I don't know when the Lord's coming back, but it could continue to get worse. The importance of the fellowship of the church. The importance of being in your Bible. If it's like this in a green leaf, what's it going to be like in a dry season? And I'm thinking that we could be headed for some dry, for some dry seasons. What, what's, the, uh, what's the answer to that? Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, but... Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Remember the things that you've been taught. The Bible verses that turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 and everybody pulls out your paper and doesn't turn in your, <laughs> turn in your Bible. So you all start quoting the verses before I can find it in my Bible because nobody gave me a paper to be able to, to read off from. Uh, God knows us and wants to help us to live in peace. Not just in peace, but in peace of mind and heart. 
as well as on the victory side. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and then they might have it more abundantly. Can we have an abundant life in these last days when all the rest of the world has gone, gone bad? If you can't handle the news, turn it off. Just turn it off. One of the best things I like about making our trip overseas is for two weeks, I have no idea what's going on back here, you know, unless some major, major, major event happens. But I've discovered when I come back two weeks later and I do, okay, what's going on? I turn Fox News on, same old stuff. It's still gone. I mean, different people, same complaints. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, and not of evil, to give you an expected end. To give you an expected end. So, next, next Wednesday night, we'll look at, okay, how do I deal? When I am discouraged, when I am depressed, what am I supposed to do? The Bible's very clear on several things that we can do, so I try to leave, leave you with a couple of good verses so you won't walk out of here and say, well, that was depressing. <laughs> Things are bad and getting worse, and nothing's looking up. Father, we thank you for this time to be able to uh, spend some time a little bit longer than usual looking at distress and looking at discouragement and the depression that can go with it. Lord, there's people in this church that I'm sure have gone through depression just because of long-term things that have gone on in their lives, in their business, in their work, in their family, and just because of life. Lord, we're thankful that we have a Bible and we have you to be able to come to. We have a church to be able to encourage us. We have a pastor that preaches the Bible to be able to teach us and instruct us and help keep us on track. Lord, would you come back and would you come back soon? But until you do, may we be found living in the midst of all the chaos an abundant Christian life knowing that our best days really are lying ahead. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Brother Dave.